Hey, Catherine, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's going to be, um, I'm really excited for this podcast. I always say that some of my podcasts that we do are like, you know, it's after a long day and I'm either tired and I'm like, you know, I don't know what to expect, but this one I'm really excited. And then I think it's going to be really great for the listeners. So um, let's start by tell everybody who you are and what you're all about. Okay, so my name is Catherine Adamick. I am. Well, I was a short track speed skater. I competed in the 2010 Olympic Games, and I won a silver and a bronze medal. Um, shortly after that, I needed a couple hip surgeries. Um, I'm, I made it back from my first surgery, but after the second and third one, I was totally injured beyond repair and ended up retiring before the 2014 Games. I moved to Milwaukee to start coaching, and after a couple years of coaching, um, decided you know my back's feeling better and my mind's just not in a great place because I felt like I had to give up my sport early. So I made a comeback. I started training for the 2018 games. Um, That was a crazy roller coaster ride. Um, Tons of ups and downs, but mostly what I learned was that um, there's this really cool world about sports psychology out there where with or without the result that you want, there are ways to um, perform at your best and to to really find confidence and resilience in what it is that you do. Um, like I said, with or without the result, results are great, right? Like, and I've had great results and I've had bad results, but at the end of the day, it's how you let yourself feel about them. Um, and I've had plenty of great results where I didn't let myself feel good afterwards and plenty of poor results where I was able to say, you know what, I did my best and I, I'm okay. So uh, what I do now is just try to help people, A, increase performance, but B, I mean, train their mind to, to get better, to get more comfortable in that place of focusing on effort and process, not perfection, not results, but just truly on being the best you that you can be. Yeah. And I talk a lot about process versus results. Tell everybody what, what that's like and what your, I guess you could say your philosophy on that. What's the importance of results versus process? So my opinion on it is that um, a good process almost always begets good results. But a good result says nothing really about your process. You might have had a good one, you might have had a bad one and just got lucky. Um, you might have been competing in a complete um, stage of fight, 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 flight, freeze mm-hmm. and happened to nail it right when you needed to. Um, and so don't get me wrong, like I said, I've, I've had some great performances and it's, it's kind of easy to feel like those are the moments that you live for, right? That that deep sense of internal validation of like, you've proven yourself and you've done it. And I don't want to take that away from anyone. But what I want to give to people is this feeling of you can have the intense feeling of satisfaction and validation through an incredible process. Um, And so definitely going back to the first thing, which was a good process almost always begets good results, but good results don't mean you have a good process. And so yeah, yeah. and athletes i'm really trying to teach them how to do process first mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's it's so so true but you being an olympic medalist what talk talk to me about because i know a lot of people like being a an olympic athlete or even being somebody that has a high achiever once you reach when you have a goal right once you reach that goal a lot of times there's like this feeling of emptiness because you don't you feel like that's all there is and you feel like okay what else is there so talk to me about that in regards to you being a, an Olympic uh, athlete and as well as that process versus results style. Yeah, that's really something um, for as much as I prepared to be ready for the games. And I think for as much as anybody who's a high performer prepares to succeed at anything, we don't really tend to talk about in our society what happens after the success because you get you get your validation, you get your satisfaction, you get your 15, excuse me, 15 minutes of fame that you've, that you've dreamt of, right? And then you realize, wait a minute, I've achieved everything I ever wanted. And now I have to keep going. Like life keeps going. Right. <laughs> Next. Or just if nothing else, um, you know, I had this misconception that after I won Olympic medals that Um, that I would be perfect, right? That I would have so many friends and I'd be financially stable and I'd be the best speed skater of all time. And that would start coming easily. And just, 
I really thought that my whole life was going to change. And um, what I found out is that my life changed for about three months. And then it was time to get back to work. And nothing was easier. Actually, everything was harder because <laughs> I had now I had to be better, right? I couldn't just be Catherine. I was Catherine the Olympic medalist. And I have to be more perfect than I ever was before. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's kind, of a, it's, it's kind of a mean trick that the world is playing by making you think that, and it's not really the world, we do it to ourselves. It's a mean trick we play on ourselves to think that when we achieve that goal, then we'll be happy. Instead of looking at how do I, how do I build and create my happiness today? My goals will come, but how do I build and create the day? Right, yeah, yeah. And I know that there was this, there was a, um, it was like a study that was going around that they were finding that people that were astronauts that went to the moon, they were coming back severely depressed because mm -hmm. they, when, when they saw the world from like this masterful view of, you know, all those people and life, humanity is down there and we're up here. They felt like the dis this disconnect. And when they came back, they're like, I feel like I'm missing something. And I feel like there's something more that I don't have. And I feel like, you know, I feel like almost like I've accomplished what other people down here can accomplish. And that made them feel so empty inside. And I feel like a lot of athletes and high achievers that are focusing more on the result as opposed to the process end up that way because they're like, you know, what, what more is there? And okay, now that I won the championship, now what, you know, where, where do I fit right. into humanity? Where do I fit into the world? Where do I fit in everyone's image of me? Right? Yeah, for sure. So I actually, I feel like I see both sides of that really well. I mean, I haven't heard that story, but I totally believe it. And mm. I'll share with you, like, so I got, I got a silver and bronze medal by the time I was 21. Wow. And I very much had the thought, I mean, several times, like, what if this is the coolest thing I ever do? <laughs> what if I have 60 more years to live? Yeah, that's a scary thought. <laughs> this moment, like, that's scary. Right. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to say for anyone who is younger and still like early on in their process that life does get cooler, you know, <laughs> all the records and win all the medals life after whatever it is that you do is really, really cool. Um, and so, but, but yeah, you can't get caught up in just that achievement thinking that that's going to be the pinnacle of your life because life does go on. And then we start looking at this bigger picture, which I actually kind of like to imagine what the world looks like out in space because I, I really like the idea that I'm such a small piece yeah. and specifically I really love, well, obviously not from space, but just when I get to travel and I get to buy, be by either the ocean or by mountains, I remember that the world is so much bigger than me mm -hmm. and my problems are so small yeah. and and I really like that. I mean, I guess it can be depressing because we work so hard and how do you know if what you're doing really matters? But then it's because what you're doing matters globally, right? Not just to you and the people that you impact in your circle, um, but, you know, being the most winningest Olympian of all time, which not that I was, but just to, to paint this picture of you can be highly successful and how many people do you really truly touch? People see magazines, people listen to your podcasts, they want to interview you for on CNN, whatever, but how many lives do you impact? Right. This is, I don't, I don't compete anymore, but now I coach. I impact 20 lives daily, right? right? And that's my responsibility and you can't see that from space. And yet that's, that's why it's cool to be a part of something so much bigger than you because your little piece of it impacts everyone around you. Yeah. And talk to us about how performing and qualifying for the Olympics and representing a country, how does that make you feel? And how much value does that add? Like you said, being part of something bigger and being part of something greater. How, what, how is that performing? How does that affect you? You know, performing and that mindset actually, for me, caused a lot of performance anxiety, just feeling like, what if I let people down? Mm -hmm. And then also... I mean, speed skating and, and training in general is my passion, but you do have to make a living at what you do. And so it's great when your passion gets to be your work, but that doesn't necessarily take away the fact that you have to be successful enough to earn a living at whatever it is you're doing. And so I had so much pride 
competing as an American. Um, I can honestly say that what motivated me through some of my toughest workouts and the moments that I just wanted to quit was visualizing my flag and singing my national anthem with a medal around my neck. And that, that's all I needed to keep going. Um, at the same time, you know, there, there does come a point where it's a, it's a lot of pressure and it's a lot of stress and learning how to deal with that. Um, well, it's just, it's pretty hard. It's not, it's not fun and it's pretty hard. And the lucky ones, I guess, figure it out maybe by mistake and not everybody is so lucky. Right, right. Yeah. And talk to us about what it's like to prepare physically and mentally um, in the months and days and even seconds before that shotgun goes yeah. off. So, I mean, our training routine was, was really wild. Um, we would be at the rink warming up by eight. So you'd have an on your own warm up from eight to eight twenty, and then a team warm up from eight twenty to eight forty, which was pretty much another workout. I mean, our warm ups were extremely intense. Um, you had 20 minutes to get your stuff on, to get onto the ice. And then we would skate from nine to 11. Um, some of our, some of our crazier workouts would be like, maybe we'd start with our first hour on ice, like five sets of nine laps, which is about a minute and a half exertion. Um, so five sets of a minute and a half, we'd get off, the Zamboni would come out and cut the ice, but we'd have to stay warm. We'd be jumping around, jogging, stretching, like trying to keep a sweat going because if you've ever tried to split a really intense workout into two pieces, like that second set hurts so much worse if you let your body get cold in yeah. between. So we're basically working out, even though we're re it's the rest period of our workout. Uh, we go back on the ice and usually we would finish that workout with two lappers. Um, and then some starts, some technical work, get off the ice. We'd have dry land until about noon. Um, go home, be back between 2.30 and 3. And then we either skate again. Um, we might do weights. We might run. We might bike. Afternoon training could be all sorts of things, but we usually wrap it up around 6 or 6.30 at home and eat and go to bed. And This was every day? Uh, five days a week. Wow. Yeah, and then Saturdays would be like eight to eight to noon thirty. So we'd still get a good four and a half hours in on Saturdays. Um, and then Sundays were a rest day. And actually competition weeks are the best weeks for training because all of a sudden, I mean, if your life as an athlete is to stress your body and be tired, then your life as a competitor is to relax. You eat well, eat enough, sleep enough. Uh, drink enough water and it's that one week leading up to race day is all about feeling good um, of course at that moment you become kind of obsessed with any little twinge of feeling bad so you kind of become hyper aware and therefore a little bit more nervous um, but at the same time that's a really fun week to like give yourself the grace and space to just recover um, and then on race day I have an analogy that I like where every day that you train, you're, you're, writing a, you're writing a check, you're making a deposit in the bank. And on race day, you have to write your check for a withdrawal. And you just have to hope that your bank account, that your savings is more than everyone else's. Right. Like you don't know until you get there. So at that point, it's really out of your hands. Um, you can't do anything to get stronger. All you can do is show up and be your best and hope that you prepared well enough. Yeah, I love that. I love that analogy. That's great. And what, what about mentally? What about mentally? Like, I'm sure right before you're about to perform, it's probably, it's probably hell going on inside your head, right? So I manage my performance anxiety by um, trying to find all the variables that I could control. And that was really exhausting, but also really helpful. And so, for example, if I'm in a race with three other people, I would prepare for that race by going through and saying, what's my ideal strategy? Like, exactly how do I want this to go? And then, okay, well, we know that's not going to happen. So what's the second most likely, third most likely, fifth most likely, 10th most likely? And I mean, I wouldn't go on forever and ever, but I would at least go on to the point where I felt literally nothing can surprise me. Anything that happens in the, in the race, I'm not going to be making a decision at that point. I will be truly reading and reacting because the decisions I've already thought out and they've already been made. Um, and so it, it was a very tiring way to manage stress, and yet it was effective because I never got surprised. And when I work with athletes now, I, I tell them this rule of expect the expected. Something happens in your day or in your performance or in your workout every day that rattles you, right? 3 p.m. every day we get tired or we get hungry. 
did we pack a healthy snack? Probably not. That's why we go to Starbucks at three o'clock and get a muffin <laughs> or a donut or whatever. And yet, so every day we come home like, ah, oh, I didn't make those healthy choices today. And yet, you know what's going to happen. You know at three o'clock every day you need a coffee and a sugar break. So plan appropriately, plan ahead. And right. you, so that's kind of what I would do in my racing. Like, I know that being surprised really rattles me in the middle of a race. So I'm going to control the variables to reduce the chance of surprise. And that really worked for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know there was um, an Olympian by the name of Siri Lindley. I've talked about this before. And she used visioning for a whole year before her triathlon race. Mm -hmm. And she would go through the vision of her succeeding and, you know, being in first place the whole time. Right. And then the day of the race came, and she took a leap into the pool and she blacked out and she finally like gets herself, you know, gets, becomes conscious again and like realizes she's in last place. She gets out of the pool, continues, finishes the race. And at the end, a reporter came over to her and said, Siri, what happened? Like you were so prepared and so confident for this race. What happened? And she says, you know, the fact that I blacked out was just a technical difficulty that I, I hit somebody and we collided. Right. But the more importantly was I, when I visioned this race for 365 days for a whole year before, believing that I was going to be ready and be perfect, the problem was that I only believed what I wanted to believe, right? I only visioned what I wanted to happen, but not what, I, what could happen, like you said, right? I envisioned what if I collided into the pool? How would I regain my composure and get back into the race? I never thought of that. And she said that to me was the variable of the reason why I wasn't able to get back and really be my best because I was, I was thinking about the best and I wasn't thinking about what about second or third or what if I was right behind or what if something, one technical difficulty happened, how would I regain my composure on that? Yeah, I, and I think that that's a similar thing happened in the 1500 for me at the Olympics where I had practiced success so many times in my head that when something bad happened, I wasn't ready for it. And so that's something you only really learn through experience because I would absolutely recommend to visualize yourself having success so that you're prepared for that moment. You don't become like a deer in headlights. But then unfortunately, lessons are best learned the hard way. Um, yeah. And hopefully someone listening to this podcast hasn't learned this lesson the hard way yet and can kind of listen to our stories and realize like, ooh, I'd better visualize plans two through 10 also, you know, just to make sure. Um, because yeah, eventually I did start learning. You know, now that I'm thinking back, I did this before the 1500. I don't know why I just didn't, I guess I just got nervous that day in the 1500 and, and really wanted to will myself to win. And I only thought about the positives, but usually as a racer, I would think to myself, okay, what happens if I fall off the start and I'm in last place? with, you know, I'm a half lap back with four laps to go. What am I going to do? Right. I really would genuinely have a plan for the worst case scenario. And so maybe that's where the middle ground is, is like, you know, your best case, you know, your worst case, and maybe like three or four cases in between. That way you don't go crazy from trying to micromanage everything, but you're all prepared, um, whether it's a great day or whether it's a bad day. Um, and I'll just share one more story. I had a teammate, Travis Janer, who would always say to me, especially on those hard days when you just really, really don't think you can keep going. Those are the days where he'd say, I train for this because I know I'm not going to feel perfect the day that I need to. God is, God is good, but God is not that good. You know what I mean? Like, of course God is good. And yet <laughs> yeah, I got you. <laughs> when have you ever had the perfect day on the day that you needed it? That never happens ever. We're fooling ourselves if we think we're going to walk in and everything's going to be just the way we want it. That's, that's not reality. So actually days that you're tired and you're frustrated and you're disappointed, that's probably what you're going to feel like on the day you have to perform in real life. So that's the day you have to really lean in and get comfortable with that feeling, not shy away like, oh, I only, I only train to feel good. No, reality is only the luckiest athletes actually feel good on race day. Everybody else has an injury, uh, some anxiety didn't sleep well last night, something. Yeah. And I think part of being able to perform at your best is, is reflecting on 
that you are, the fact that you're there is such a huge step, right? The fact that you're standing in that line, that starting line, and there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that want to be in your position and that have worked to be and trained to be in your position, but you're the one there, there's probably a huge um, experience of gratitude where you're like, I'm, the fact that I'm here means so much. And the fact that I've trained for this, I, it proves who I am and what my abilities really are. You know, I, you'd think so. You, <laughs> everything you just said makes sense, but that really wasn't my experience. Um, mm -hmm. Because when I made the team, and this was just my mindset at the time, I was, I was a machine when I was a kid. And I remember when I was 16, part of my visualization practice was I would, I would record a, a tape recording of me saying to myself and listen to it at night, I'm a machine. I can keep going. I can do anything. I, I, like, I think one of them was like, nothing makes me tired, but I would immediately phrase it into a positive and say, so I can do anything. I can always keep going. Um, and so when I got to the games, I hadn't really been developing this sense of personal self. I'd really been developing this sense of like all in badass speed skater self. Hopefully don't bleep that out. No, please, please. We love it. <laughs> Um, and so, and when I made the team, I had a lot of people like, oh my gosh, aren't you just out of your mind? And my response was, honestly, I'm in this to win a medal. Of course, I'm happy to make the team. That's a, that's a mandatory step along the way, but I didn't come this far just to make the team. I'm here to win a medal. And, um, that's, as you are saying, you know, a million people can look at that and think, man, I wish I was there. But then if you just, if you look at it from the flip side and you consider like, I'm not, at that time, it wasn't, I'm not living my life to train my life. or to, I'm not living my life to live my life. I'm living my life to win an Olympic medal. Right. That's, that's it. That's what I'm doing right now. And that is it. Right. And um, it led to really great things. It pushed me to dig deeper mentally and physically than I ever thought I could. And um, I believe that everyone should do that. I believe that everyone should have so Saturdays for us, let me just share a story. Saturdays for us were always kind of our mental toughness days. And the workouts were stupid. Climb that mountain 10 times, <laughs> 200s 10 times, or skate in this, skate in a lap. I remember one week our coach put us, we were doing time trials, which means one skater on each side of the rink for 30 laps. And it was like a race to see who would die first. And the, the goal of the game was to try to catch the person you were up against. And I was up against a girl at Dame named Lana Gehring, who is a two-time Olympian, bronze medalist, and great endurance athlete. And oh my God, we went at like 90% of our max speed for 30 laps. I was full on like hyperventilation, panic attack, like my eyes were bugging out of my head, but I refused to lose to Lana. And she was doing the same thing with me. And I mean, we both got better that day, but if you look on pen and paper, like how did that make me stronger? The reality is that you never race 30 laps that fast, literally ever. But the mental training to say, no, no, I will die before I give up. I will pass out on this ice rink before I agree to, I were before I willingly let myself get beat, you know? And maybe that sounds crazy, but now I'm a coach and I'm thinking through like, how do I challenge my athletes in this way? Because it's not a surprise if you want your body to get stronger, you have to go a little bit harder than you can. You have to get yourself sore. You have to tear your muscle fibers. But we don't think about mentally that same way. Mentally, we think about, oh, I want to feel good. I want to do whatever it takes to feel confident and resilient and feel good. But the fact is that you build confidence and resilience by making yourself do things that feel bad. And a lot of mental toughness in my life has simply come from looking up a mountain and feeling like there's no way that it's a good idea to do that. But you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going to do a good job and I'm going to have a great attitude about it or else I'm going to die. Like there was no middle ground there. Again, I know that's intense. Maybe not everybody can, can go all the way there and yet <laughs> challenge yourself, not just physically, but mentally to do something you think you can't do. Yeah, yeah, and and I know Will Smith. He used to say mm -hmm. that 
when I get on a treadmill, he says, there is no way that the guy next to me, if I came on the treadmill, there's someone on the treadmill next to me, there is no way in hell that I'm getting off that treadmill before him. I don't care if it means that my legs feel like they're falling off. There is no way that he's going to outrun me. And uh, it's just, it's an attitude, right? It's just a, a, the, the mental ability to say, I'm not going to give up and I'm just going to keep on going. And I think that's also, there's a, the beauty of failure in that, where, like you said, sometimes you only learn through those tough times and through those failures. And when you do fail, it ignites this spark inside of you where you're like, you know what, I'm going to push harder or I'm going to keep on going. Or, and it just, it's really, it's all about that mindset where knowing that failure is not necessarily bad because it builds and it shapes you to, into who you are and who you want to become. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, failure doesn't feel good. Um, the same teammate, Travis Jayner, one of the was very impactful person in my life at that point because he was so motivating. Um, he would say, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. And he was so true. It's so true. And it hurts your feelings to not get what you want, especially when you worked hard for it and you feel like you earned it and maybe you really deserved it, but you don't always get what you want. Sometimes the best thing you get is to walk away with more experience. Um, and if we can celebrate that as something worthwhile, we don't have to walk away from failure feeling like I'm a failure. You know, it can be, I mean, an example I use with athletes is like, if I say that, hey, that sucked, right? That race sucked. That is different than me saying you suck. Right. Yeah. I don't use those words with athletes, but I know that athletes use those words with themselves. And I know people, right? If you goof something up, I'm trying to think of a good example just recently, but sometimes something sucks, but that doesn't mean that I suck. I mean, that was, a, that was a sucky situation. And the only thing that came from it was that I learned something. Right. Okay. Keep moving forward. Keep going. Yeah. I hear it all the time. I play a lot of basketball and I hear all the time. These people are like, oh my God, I suck. And I look at them and I turn to them. I say, you don't suck. It was just your performance that sucked, right? Like you shot like shit, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't, necessarily mean that's who you are as a person just because you shot bad and you had a bad day in basketball on the court doesn't mean that you're a bad player it just means you got to get back into the gym and go work a little harder and go work on sure. in, on your shots and work on your three or whatever it is right yeah it's the difference between um taking it personal versus staying objective and so mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a mindset client who says oh i'm just lazy i'm so lazy and i'm like are you, are you? i mean if you're really truly la a lazy person and you don't like that about yourself, let's talk about some strategies to be better. But if the reality is that you have three jobs and a kid and your back hurts and this and that and na na na, and sometimes you just don't feel like cooking, gosh darn it, that's not lazy. You're, you're taking something that could be an objective reason and turning it into a personal excuse. And, um, and that's, that's not necessary, right? Like if I had a good trainer tell me once, or a psychologist actually told me that the difference between a reason and excuse is that an excuse is personal and a reason is objective. We don't tend to learn from our excuses. We can learn from our reasons. Um, and so I guess I, I haven't figured out like the, the actual mindset strategy to kind of help, help people shift that way of thinking. But I, we are far too likely to take it personal and to say, I suck. Something's wrong with me, as opposed to, like you're saying, yeah, the mechanics of your shot were off tonight. Right. That sucks. Better go practice some more. But as, I'll still go grab a beer with you, right? Like, nothing's wrong with you as a person. <laughs> Maybe your shoulder's tight. Maybe your elbow hurts. I don't know. Go foam roll. You'll be better next time. And, but you can't learn from, I suck. You can learn from, oh, my mechanics were off. Let me fix that. Yeah, and there's, uh, on those lines, there was a, a psychologist by the name of Carol Dweck. I don't know if you heard of her. Oh, I love her. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. she's actually one of my favorite books. She has a book called Mindset. And in the book, she talks about, through her research, she found that there's two different mindsets, right? There's a fixed mindset and there's a growth mindset. And the people with the grow growth mindset embraced failure and embraced challenge because they knew that that made them better. It made them a better athlete or a better student or a better husband or wife, whatever it was. And the people with the fixed mindset allowed their failure or their setback to define who they were as a person. And they would look at them like exactly what we're talking about. They would look at shooting, having a bad shooting night and be like, I suck. That's a direct 
insults and a direct hit on me as a person or as a basketball player right. versus the growth mindset where they would say, you know what, it's fine because I'm looking at it objectively and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to go back into the gym and work on that shot that I missed 17 times in that game so that the next time I get on the court, I'll make it and I'll be a better person. I'll be a better right. player. For sure. I'll just add on with kind of my interpretation of her fixing growth mindset and that in addition to, to what you had just said, when I, what really resonated with fixed mindset for me is that someone with a fixed mindset believes that their talent and ability is something they were born with. And it's something that comes innately from inside you. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that when you're a high performer, that feels great, right? To think like, I perform because I was born with this ability to be a rock star. Right. It feels really cool. That's self-efficacy at its best. But then you don't, you don't win every time, right? So then when you fail, because you've, you've created this belief that it's something from deep inside you, it's a talent that you have, then when you fail, well, you're really not as talented as you thought, are you? Are you really not as good enough deep down, deep down inside as you thought you were? And that's where the fixed mindset tears people apart versus that, fixed, that growth mindset of if I succeed, it has nothing to do with anything well i mean talent is a thing right but the growth mindset is more i can change my destiny through my work ethic and i hope i get lucky along the way and i hope i have talents along the way but whether i do or don't i can i can build and create my best future through my work ethic and when i fail that tells me how to work harder and when i succeed that's a validation that yeah i worked pretty hard i did enough Whereas the other person, the fixed mindset person, and, and I resonate 100% with this. I think even, everybody does. <laughs> even when you win, you have to keep winning. I've got like 34 World Cup medals. None of them made me good enough. Every one I got was literally like, well, next week I want two. Mm -hmm. Next week, the, I, got a, I got an individual and a, and a team. Next week, I want two individuals. Next week, I want to break a record with it, right? And it it's never enough until you adopt that mindset of like, I'm going to, I'm going to lean in when it hurts. I'm going to show the world what I've got in terms of work ethic. If I'm not where I want to be today, I'm going to go home and work harder. Whether I get what I want or not, it's all about my ability to build and create what makes me my best me today. And I find that infinitely more satisfying and validating than any medal that I own. When you want to talk about long-term sustainability with mindset, it's not the external factors validating you from within. It's your internal validation of yourself that you project out, that you project outwards. Right, right. Yeah, very true. Um, I was actually, you led me perfectly into this subject, but talk to me about, I know, like I saw a picture of you on skates. They were like, um, like baby skates. You What are you, three or five? Yeah. And I think people would say, or people would argue like, oh, she was like a natural born skater and she was born to be a skater and her, her body fits the perfect shape and form to be a skater. And like, how do you, how would you answer that as for someone that would say she's just a natural born talent and she was born into it as opposed to someone that worked hard for it? Yeah. So I have some, I have some genetic things about me that are really cool. Like I put on muscle mass quickly like my mom. When my mom hits the weight room, she's like not even trying. She goes up five pounds every set because she's naturally strong. Mm -hmm. My dad is a phenomenal endurance athlete. And actually all the men on my dad's side of the family would specialize in the 400, 800 or the mile. So I was, I was born with some pretty cool genetics. I can, and I, and I'll, I'll give you that. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I mean, I was the only girl on my team until I was 16 years old. And I mean, you, wah, wah, right? Like some sob story. But I mean, think about like, I'm 10. I'm training with 15 year old boys. None of these guys want to be my friend, right? Like, I'm constantly getting my butt whooped and try hanging out, like try being friends with a 15 year old guy as a 10 year old girl. There's no common ground at all. So that wasn't talent that got me through that. That was the ability to say, speed skating is my favorite thing. This isn't fun right now, right, to be in this situation, or maybe I get bullied a little bit, or I don't have friends, or I don't get all the coaches' attention. But when I'm skating, I'm really happy. So I'm going to keep going with this. Um, 
And I just have to kind of wonder if there was something that made you really happy, just a thing, even if the situation surrounding it wasn't fun, could you find the joy in the thing enough to keep going? Um, and I think that goes outside of the world of sport because I'm going through it right now with my business. Coaching makes me really happy, whether that's in the weight room, on the ice, or working specifically on mental skills. Impacting others makes me incredibly happy. Learning about marketing, finances, accounting, like all the other, whatever else comes with entrepreneurship, those things aren't fun. So now it's really just a matter of are they so not fun that I'm willing to modify the thing it is that I do? Or do I love what I do enough to put up with the bullshit sometimes? And in, some people can handle that for a long time. Some people can just sit in a not fun situation and keep going. And I don't know if that's genetic or if that's just plain stubborn work ethic. Um, but either way, I know it's not easy. I know it's actually really quite hard. Um, and you have to develop the tenacity to do it. It's not ingrained. It's not natural. You develop it by how much you love what you're doing. Yeah. And I think that's a huge part of it is that when you have a passion for something and you really enjoy it and there's something that you love so much that it gets you out of bed in the morning and you're like, I can't wait to do this specific thing, whether it's, you know, qualifying for the Olympics or whether you're starting a business and that, that ability to be so passionate about something to me is really the key in being able to withdraw it and to persist any hardship and anything that comes to you that hurts and that hits you hard and tries to knock you down and you get back up is that passion, that deep fire that's burning within inside, inside of you that you say, I'm going to keep on going because I love this so much and I feel good when I do it. And I feel like I'm giving back. And like you said, coaching, I'm the same way. When I coach somebody, I feel like I'm, I'm helping them. And when you help somebody else, you're living outside of your own personal needs and your own self-indulgement and your own ego. It's I'm helping somebody else become great. I'm helping somebody else reach that next level, that next plateau, that next um, real level of achievement that they can say, oh my God, I'm so proud of myself. But between me and you, we look at ourselves and we say, you know, we, the fact that we are able to help them do that and reach that next level is very complimenting to us and it makes us feel good and it inspires us to do more and to help somebody else. Yeah, for sure. So something I teach athletes when I'm working with them is, I mean, a lot of athletes will get discouraged when they're not perfect today. And I tell them to think of it like a bullseye and the very center, or like, sorry, like a dartboard. And the very center is your bullseye and that means everything goes perfect. And you're gonna hit it sometimes. You're training to try to hit it every time but the reality is that just, that just plain doesn't happen. But then we start looking at some of the outer rings of the dartboard. Well, if you can't be perfect, can you learn? Yeah. If you can't be, if you can't learn something, like if you're not in the middle of learning something right now, can you, can you be aware of something that can be done better? Sure. Well, if you, and if you're not able to be aware of what can be done better today, are you able to be aware of your teammates? Definitely. If you're able to be aware of your teammates, can you impact them on a level that's deeper than your sport? or that's deeper than whatever it is that you do? And the answer is always yes. And so I don't care how far out on the dartboard you have to get, the outside ring is always making a positive impact for others. And once you start there, first of all, if that's as, if that's as close as you can get today to the bullseye, that's close enough. But second of all, you'd be amazed how helping someone else suddenly starts to help yourself. And you get closer just because now it's not just you anymore. You're, you're going somewhere with somebody and you matter. They matter. What you're doing matters. And all of a sudden that bad day is not so bad anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that essentially is how we make the world a better place, right? When we stop focusing so much about our personal achievements and more about our, the world's achievements, that's how the world starts to become more unified and we say you know what it's not so much about me and it's not so much about me making the money or me making the team or me doing this but it's more about representing and being part of something greater than yourself that's how the world starts to become this master world right that's how the world becomes one when everybody's interacting with each other and helping each other you you start to have a, a link of of unification yeah for sure i have a, a good friend named his name is Dr. Joe. He's one of my chiropractors. And he says that um, abundance comes from joy, not the other way around. And I just think that 
to me, that's so powerful because here I was living for so many years thinking that an abundance of metals would, wake, would make me happy. And then later in life, I can easily see that an abundance of joy makes you happy, right? <laughs> The more joy you bring to the world, the more abundance the world brings back to you. But if you're chasing abundance, I mean, you'll probably have some joyful moments along the way, but that's not where joy comes from. Right. Joy drives abundance to you, not the other way around. Yeah. And then access to others, right? If you're a joyful person, who's bringing you that abundance? The people you're impacting, the people whose lives you're making better. And like you said, we all do that. We become one. The world's a bigger place. Yeah, yeah. And I know this is a little bit of a sore, a sore idea and sore story, but I know Tony Robbins, I've heard him say this story personally, but he talks about Robin Williams. And he says how everyone loved Robin Williams. He was like the fan favorite, everybody. And he says this, he says, raise your hand if you loved Robin Williams, not liked Robin Williams, loved Robin Williams. And the whole entire room, every yeah. single time, yeah. they love him. They start screaming and they start raising their hands. And he says, Robin Williams, he says, I personally met him. And he says, Robin Williams was someone that was an extremely high achiever. He really, he constantly pushed himself to compete and to become better and to become more and to become greater and to become, um, to push himself to be the best. And he started with a, with being an actor, a funny actor. And then he said, I want to win a, an award for being funny. And he did. And then he said, I want to start my own funny TV show. And he did. And then he said, I want to be in a movie when I'm serious. And he did. And then he said, I want to make my own movie and be serious and win an award. And he did. And Tony says, and then he goes ahead and kills himself. And he talks about how when you're chasing just your personal own achievement, and I, I know it's very hard to talk about someone else's suicide. And this is a very sore topic for me. But to talk about and to try to justify someone else's suicide is almost not fair. But what Tony was saying and was trying to bring out is that when you start to live with more belonging to the world, and it's not so much about chasing the next thing. Like you said, if you just keep on chasing abundance, you'll feel like it's never over and you'll never feel truly satisfied versus going and saying, okay, I'm living for something greater. I want to help the greater good. I want to help the world. And you find so many people that are trying to cure cancer and trying to cure leukemia and all these different sicknesses because they understand that it's not so much about my own personal achievement. Yeah, I can make a couple million dollars here and there, but that's not what's going to make me happy because right. the result and those, those real materialistic things are just things and they don't last. But when you start to give yourself and give your, your efforts and your life over to something greater, that's real joy and that's real accomplishment. Yeah, I agree. I think the downside is just finding what your thing is going to be. And I got super lucky to find speed skating at a young age. Most kids probably don't find the sport or the thing that they are most well suited for early enough to know like, yeah, this is my thing. This is my passion. This is what I want to strive for. Um, and so, but that, I'm sure you're also familiar then with Angela Duckworth's book, Grit. Mm -hmm. Whereas her whole idea is like, you develop passion and perseverance over a lifetime. This is not, it's not a quick thing. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, just to kind of go back to what you said, you're right. Like it, it's kind of a morbid topic and it's not fun to talk about, but at the same time, like you're developing the passion and perseverance for what you love to do. And that's very fulfilling, but I just still always believe that there's a ring outside of that where what you love to do can also better the lives of others. Um, and sometimes we lose sight of that, right? Like I could do the same thing as a skater. I could say, oh, well, I have my medals, but who did I really impact? And I'm always chasing and I'm never good enough. And like everybody has, I call them death spirals, right? Like one bad thought. And then five minutes later, you don't really know how you got there, but you're in fight, flight, freeze. And you're pretty sure you're going to end up homeless someday and that no one, <laughs> right? You do that too, right? Please. Of course, everybody does. It's normal. <laughs> so it's, I know it's not just me. Um, and, it's, and it's scarily easy to go there. Um, but that's why you have your tribe, right? People who believe in you even when you don't believe in yourself. Someone you can just call. And my relationship with my husband got infinitely better the day that I learned how to say, honey, I'm rattled. 
I don't feel good. Something, something's up here, right? Instead of doing the typical girl thing where I just don't talk and I'm mad and I just, right, expect you to read my mind. Yeah. And then I learned how to be like, hey, I'm upset. Can you help me? Can we talk about it? Whether I'm upset with him or upset with my work or upset with whatever, but just me being vulnerable enough to say, something's wrong. I need you. Mm-hmm. Um, that's powerful. Like, yeah. Can you imagine someone, anyone in your life saying that genuinely, not someone who's using and abusing your relationship, but who's genuinely like, I am rattled. I'm not thinking clearly and I need you. Mm-hmm. Always say yes. Right. And I think hopefully there's a person listening thinking, yeah, sometimes I get really rattled, but I don't want to admit that I'm rattled. I'd rather just deal with it myself. Um, or I don't want to be a bother to people or I don't want to make other people feel bad. But then there, there is this whole other option that just is as simple as, hey, I'm rattled and I need some help. And no one will say no to that. I've never met a single person who would say no to that. Yeah, yeah. And I think the world is learning that. I think the world is learning that it's not cooler and it's not more masculine and it's not bigger and stronger to say or not be vulnerable to somebody. It's, and we're learning this. I think we're learning that it's okay to say, I need you. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to, and this is something I struggled with even as a kid growing up. And I reflect back and I'm like, if I wish I asked for more help. Well, you know, like there's nothing wrong with saying I need help. And there's nothing wrong with saying I need guidance or I need someone at my side or I want to talk to someone about something. There's nothing wrong with that. And to think that you're cooler or bigger or stronger by not telling everybody or asking for help or asking for advice on your issues is, is stupidity. And it's foolishness to say, oh, I'm too cool for that. I'm, you know, I'm the bigger guy. I'm the guy that everyone else comes to and I don't ever ask for help. But, and this is maybe when soon I'll start a podcast about relationships, but you talked about something very interesting and very important, which is vulnerability, right? The second you're able to be vulnerable to someone and say, you know, I need your help or I need you or I need to talk to you or I have to, we have to deal with this issue and I'm going to be up front and I'm going to tell you my weaknesses and my my issues and that I have with this thing and we're going to work it out together and figure it out. And that's, what's going to make us stronger. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, you can't do that with, you know, just anyone in your life. It's got to be someone in the tribe. Right. And so um, a lot of times I find that athletes and I mean, I, I refer back to athletes a lot cause that's kind of my, that's, that's who's in my group, but right. just as easily be um, an employee going to an employer. Athletes will come to me sometimes with help because my athletes are usually under 18, they haven't developed like a strong language yet for what they need to do, but they can tell they need to do something. But I want to help them develop that language so that they can come to me with a specific question. And so it's kind of like when a, a kid comes to you, oh, I feel icky, my, I, right? Like, well, what does icky mean? I have an upset tummy. Okay, like what, do you have a headache? Are you, are you hot? Are you sweaty? Icky doesn't help me very much, but if I teach you what all of these different feelings mean, if I give you a language, right. now you can be really effective in your ability to ask for help, and I can be really effective in giving help back. So if an athlete comes to me like, I don't feel good, I'm a little tougher because they, they know how I work, and I'm like, oh, that sucks. Yeah. What do you want? What, there's no, what, what's, the, what's the question, right? You're just, you're just kind of complaining at that point. Um, then to teach an athlete then how to say, I'm getting tired that this point in a set or my knees hurting when I do this, right? Mm-hmm. Develop that language. Now it's not like this dumb question of I feel bad and I don't know what to do about it. Now it's um, I'm, I'm really rattled when I don't get enough sleep. I'm really rattled when I don't eat the right food or when I just whatever, don't take care of my body. Now I can help. Now we've identified a problem and I, that we can both identify a solution to, but just the, the I suck or I don't want to or I feel bad. It, there's no solution to that problem. So we kind of inadvertently force ourselves to live there by giving ourselves an unsolvable problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's like, it's almost like teaching them the vocabulary of what they need to know, of the words they have to, they have to know. It's like finding that pressure point. Like, okay, where does it hurt? Oh, it hurts here. Okay, we can help you with that, right? Yeah. Um, awesome. Okay, so... The last part of the show, I'm going to throw questions at you and you can just give me your answers. Um, they could be short, long. It's your choice, right? Okay. Um, what's fear to you and how do you deal with it? Hmm. Fear to me is a fear of failure. 
and I deal with it by asking myself, what's the worst case scenario? And when I start to list the actual worst case scenario, my rational brain can see pretty quickly that that's not going to happen. And if it, if it is going to happen, at least I've identified the problems that I need to find solutions for before it happens. But I try to keep things, I try to keep my fear of failure fairly objective. I don't believe in it. I just kind of try to listen to it and, and learn the lesson. Mm -hmm. um, if you can start all over again, what would you do different, if anything? I would have given myself more time to recover after 2010. I was very mean to my body. I did not listen to it. I did not give it what it wanted. I forced my body to do what my brain wanted it to do. And I gave myself some pretty significant injuries from that. And so um, I would tell myself much younger that it's actually healthy to take a break. Yeah, I find that a lot with athletes. They think it's, it's almost the same mindset where, oh, it's mentally strong to keep on going, right? I have to yeah. push through pain. I have to push through pain. But the more you push through pain, the more painful it will be in the long term right as opposed to the short term they look at the short term game instead of the long term yep well medals come in the short term right, right? right. it takes a lifetime to win an olympic medal and yet once you get to that level you don't feel like you can waste any time not fulfilling your potential there's no time for that you have to keep going um right. little do you know you're limiting your potential yeah. if you could send one message to the world what would it be Wow, that's a great one. <laughs> if I could tell every individual in the world one thing, I would say that there is a piece of you that is truly undefinable. And if you can't define it about you and I can't define it about you and you can't define what it is about me, why are we so interested in looking for validation from others? And I would just let the world ponder that. <laughs> it's definitely deep. <laughs> it, well, it, it is. But if you think about it, like consciousness starts inside and we project it out. And yet the outward world comes in and it affects the way that we feel about ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's not really, that's not fair to any of us. That's not fair to anybody. And, but we live there. We, we put ourselves in that position, right? So I would just, I would just put that question out to the world and have the world ponder it. That's a good question to ponder. Um, what does success mean to you? It changes all the time. But at the moment, success feels like having a good workout with my group a little bit later. I'm coaching a team in, a, in about half an hour and um, so let me just reiterate, success, success changes at every moment based on what it is that I'm doing in that present moment. And so I try to success second to second by being fully engaged and alive in what I'm doing. That's a good one. Uh, who's your role model? Um, I'm still searching, I suppose. I have <laughs> I have lots of people who I, I take things that I really like from, um, but I don't have one person that embodies all of them. Okay, that's fair. Always learning, always uh, open to new information. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite book or movie or both? I do really like Mindset by Carol Dweck. That's probably my, my favorite book currently or The Four Agreements by um, Don Miguel Ruiz. Between those two books, that's pretty much everything I, I would need to stay yeah. entertained for the next rest of my life. <laughs> and what about movie? Any? Um, Pirates of the Caribbean, I think. Okay. All three of them. I don't, I don't, well, I guess there's technically a fourth. I haven't seen the fourth. The first three. Um, awesome, awesome. Where can people find more about you? I would love to have people check out my website, which is fixyourmindset.com. I am also on Instagram as Kat Adamic. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. It was really, really enjoyable. And there's a lot, a lot of good information here for our viewers and listeners. Thank you. I appreciate you having me.